to part two of our presentation on Christian dress. Today we're going to be looking at modesty, and the title of today's presentation is Modesty is the Issue, Part 1. So before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for being a part of our lives. Please lead and guide us as we study your word to learn more about your biblical principles of dress. Please help us to understand and to be able to apply what we learn to our lives and help us to grow closer to you and to be the Christians you want us to be. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. Amen. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about modesty, like we already said, and we can go to 1 Timothy 2.9, which is kind of a theme text when you're talking about dress. It says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety. Now, we're going to be looking at modest apparel, and we're also going to be looking at what shamefacedness and sobriety mean. Three things, what are they referring to? What principle is God trying to give us in our dress? Okay, what is modesty? Modest, the dictionary definition from Webster's 1828 dictionary, it says properly restrained by a sense of propriety. It means not bold or forward, not loose or lewd, and not excessive or extreme or extravagant. So modesty basically is not an extreme, not being too bold or forward and not being uh, impure. It, there's a restraint on what you do. And in dress, you would see this with, there's a restraint on your dress. You're not, it would, your dress is not impure and your dress is not excessive or extreme or showy or extravagant. The uh, word modesty, modernly, the dictionary defines it as the quality of not being too proud or confident about yourself or your abilities, propriety in dress, speech, or conduct. So basically modest means it's appropriate and it's not in an extreme, it's not going to draw attention to you. Okay, shamefacedness. Uh, the dictionary def defines it as bashfulness or excess of modesty. So shamefacedness is basically the same as modesty, except it's saying it's lots of modesty. It's an excess of modesty. Bashfulness is an excessive or extreme modesty, a quality of mind often visible in external appearance, as in blushing, a downcast look, confusion, etc. So bashfulness basically is... We would say someone is bashful if they're, say, meeting somebody for the first time and you can see they're kind of shy. They're not, they're not forward and bold. They're, you can see they're kind of shy. We would say they're bashful. So take and apply these principles to dress. Shamefacedness is an excess of modesty or bashfulness. Now, sobriety, it can have to do with uh, drinking and not being drunk. If you, we say someone is sober if they are not drunk. Uh, so it can have the level that goes to temperance and you're not drinking, you're not drunk. But it can also, and this is where it would fall under when it's talking about dress, uh, habitual freedom from enthusiasm or calmness, coolness, seriousness, gravity without sadness or melancholy. So basically sobriety is... Uh, also not excessive, not extreme in enthusiasm, and it's, but it's, you're serious, but you're not um, sad. That would be how it is in behavior. You are serious, but you're not sad. And if you take that to dress, think of how it would apply to dress. So these three things are God's principles of modesty in dress. Basically, you can sum up modesty, we're going to say Christian modesty is look at God 
not at me. And immodesty is look at me, not at God. So basically you can sum up what modesty is or what immodesty is by those things. If you are modest in your dress, your dress says, look at God, not at me. If you are immodest in your dress, your dress is trying to draw attention to you and not point people to God. And the same would go for behavior and words and other things. Modesty is trying to point the person to God and not to yourself. Okay, Jesus is our example of modesty. In Isaiah 53, uh, verse 2, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So as Jesus came, he had no form nor comeliness. There was nothing attractive in his physical appearance. There was no beauty that we should desire him. So Jesus came, it was not his physical appearance that was to attract people. It was his character, what was on the inside that was to attract people. And if we are following in Jesus' example, we should not be focusing on trying to have our physical appearance attract people. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our example in multiple places. In 1 John, it says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. The Bible says we're to walk as Jesus walked. And it says in 1 Peter that uh, Jesus left us an example that ye should follow his steps. So it says that we're to follow Jesus' example. So he was modest, we're to be modest. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're to have the mind of Christ. Just like he was not focused on drawing people's attention to him, he always, even though he was God, he always pointed people to the Father. We are uh, not to be focused on drawing people's attention to us. And we are not to be focused in our dress on drawing people's attention to us. We're to have the mind of Christ. It says, the mind of Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus, he was, he was God, but he made himself of no reputation. He took on him the form of a servant. He was very humble. And if we would follow his example, we should be humble in our dress. And we should be humble in our actions and words and everything. Okay, so that's basically a summary of what the word modesty in general has to do with. It has to do with us drawing attention to our selves or immodesty has to do with us drawing attention to ourselves modesty has to do with us drawing attention to god now in first timothy 2 it goes on to tell us things that are not part of modest apparel and it says that we're not to wear gold or pearls or costly array and we can see this also talked about in uh, 1 Peter 3, 3, it says, Whose adorning let not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold. So this is what the Bible says on jewelry. It says, we're not to wear gold or pearls or costly array. We're not to wear things that are expensive. We're not to wear gold. We're not to wear pearls. We're, basically, we're not to wear jewelry. Now, some people might say, well, they're wearing jewelry, but it's fake jewelry. It's not... Uh, real gold. It's not real pearls. It just looks like it. But the other principle we have to put is uh, found in 1 Thessalonians 5.22. It says to abstain from all appearance of evil. So it's not, if the Bible says don't wear gold, it says to abstain from appearance of evil. So don't wear something that looks like gold and say, well, it's not real gold, so I'm okay. Because you could lead somebody else to stumble. You could leave somebody else to actually go wear real gold. So the Bible says not to wear gold, pearls, 
not to wear jewelry, and it says but to abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, if we go further, we can find that jewelry is connected to idolatry in the Bible. In Genesis 35, starting in verse 1, God said unto Jacob, Rise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments, and let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. So Jacob wanted to go to Bethel and to make an altar unto God. And he told his household before he went, he told them to put away all their idols before they went. They were to put away their idols, they were to be clean and change their clothes. And when they gave Jacob their idols, the Bible specifically mentions that they also gave Jacob their earrings. So it, was, it is here connecting strange gods and jewelry, specifically in this case earrings. The two were connected. Now if you do, which we're not going to go through, but if you do a study you can find throughout history that idolatry and jewelry were connected even today in um, pagan circles. Idolatry and uh, jewelry are connected. We can see this. This is from a, a witch's website. It says, a Wiccan can express her spiritual self through her jewelry. So a witch can express her spiritual self through her jewelry. It says, and you might say, well, this is specific jewelry specific for witches. But it says it is useful to remember that any jewelry can be ritual or sacred jewelry. So it's not a certain kind of jewelry. They say any jewelry can work for them. That any jewelry can be sacred jewelry. It says, despite whatever you read on particular symbols, gems, medals, etc., the intention with which you wear the ornaments largely determines their effect. So it says, any jewelry can be sacred jewelry to a witch. It says the intention is basically what makes it sacred or not sacred. Now, then you have to ask yourself, what is the intention with you wearing jewelry? Is it because you love God more than anything? that you choose to wear jewelry? Or is it because you want to look nice? Is it because you want to, you have a issue of looks and pleasing yourself in your looks and you're trying to glorify yourself? Are you trying to glorify God? Or are you trying to glorify yourself? If it has to do with self, then it's self-worship and then it's idolatry. And so then your intentions are not good. Okay, we're going to be hitting on many different points in this. We're going to move on to makeup. Uh, what does the Bible say about makeup? In 2 Kings 9.30, it talks about uh, Jezebel. It says, when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. She painted her face, tired her head, and looked out at a window. Now, Jezebel is known in Old Testament history and was used as a symbol in New Testament history of apostasy and paganism and harlotry. So Jezebel is not connected to good biblical Christianity. She's connected to the exact opposite. And it talks about how she painted her face. She was known as a harlot and she painted her face. And you will see everywhere in the Bible where it talks about Makeup, it is connected to a harlot. If you go to Jeremiah 4.30, it says, When thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou closest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. So here again, it's talking about a harlot, and God says, though thou rentest thy face with painting. 
So basically, he's kind of saying, you're destroying your face with painting. But he's saying, in vain, you'll make yourself fair. So again, makeup was connected to what a harlot does to attract men. In Ezekiel 23, 40, you also have another reference. It says, And furthermore, that ye have sent for men to come from far, unto whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came, for whom thou didst wash thyself, paintest thine eyes, and deckest thyself with ornaments. So she was had men come, and one of her th things this harlot did to prepare was she painted her eyes. So all the references in the Bible to painting of one's face they are never connected to a Christian. They're always connected to paganism and a harlot. Now, does this play out in history? In this quote, we can see that this did play out in history. It says, Many women who use cosmetics in these cultures adopted the use of cosmetics for the purpose of harlotry. History shows how women applied makeup to change their appearance and seduce men. Harlots and matrons, the female leaders of prostitution rings, were specifically recognized by their silk, jewels, and cosmetics. Here is an example of how women who use cosmetics in ancient Sparta were specifically known for being prostitutes. And it quotes, Women wore brightly colored dresses. They used a lot of cosmetics, which a woman could do only if she earned her living through prostitution. The first women to wear makeup were prostitutes. One's appearance by facial paint is an ancient custom prostitutes have dictated to the modern age. So we can see in history that makeup was connected to prostitution. We see that both in biblical history and we can see it in secular history. We can also see that makeup is connected to witchcraft. This is another quote. It says, The use of makeup is also said to stem from witchcraft, where the painting of one's face was believed to ward off evil. Makeup was used extensively by American Indian witch doctors and European witches. Mascara was particularly a charm inasmuch as it is made of antimony, an old witch metal. So makeup is connected to harlotry and prostitution, but it is also connected to witchcraft, and it was used by witches. We can see how the makeup also had specific meanings for different types of makeup. We can see this in this is a quote from Lori Cabot, which is the high priestess of witchcraft. She says, outlining the eye emulates, or meaning imitates, the goddess who is often portrayed with large distinctive eyes, capable of seeing through space and time as well as into our innermost hearts. Ishtarte, the goddess of light, was known in the ancient Middle East as the eye goddess because the light she brings from heaven to earth illuminates the world. But the tradition of outlining the eye to honor the goddess of love and to make one's own eyes more radiant and mysterious is a time-honored custom. So you can see this high priestess of witchcraft is saying the reason that they outline the eye is connected to them trying to imitate their pagan goddess. They're trying to look like her. So even the different types of makeup in the occult have different meanings with them. So as Christians, we should not be doing things that are connected to idolatry, paganism, prostitution. Those should not be in the dress of a Christian. Okay, so we saw that makeup was something harlots uh, wore. If you go to Proverbs 7, verse 10, Proverbs 7 is a chapter dealing with a woman that is trying to seduce a man. And in this chapter, it talks about the woman. It says, Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. So this woman had on the clothing of a harlot. And so we can see in the Bible, there's a specific clothing that is connected to a harlot. Now we've seen already that makeup can play a role in that uh, clothing. But we're going to go through some more things that can play a role in the clothing of a harlot. Now, John Gill, who was an English 
Baptist pastor in the 1600s, he said, based on this verse, he gives us a little explanation with it. He says, Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of harlot. He says, Not with her face veiled as Tamar was in Genesis. For though that might be the sign of a harlot in the daytime, yet not at night as this was. And then he defines what type of clothing this woman was most likely wearing. Rather, with showy, gaudy garments, such as the Athenian whores wore, or short ones as the Romans, the word signifies one fitted to her body, neat and well-shaped to recommend her. So he lists, based on the other, uh, the other kingdoms and nations around, that the different types of clothing that harlots wore. They would wear showy, gaudy garments. So they would wear things that are not modest. They're to attract the attention to self. In uh, ancient Rome, they would wear short ones. And it says the word there signifies one fitted to her body. So it was one that was well fitted, probably tight clothing. It was something to show off her body. And this is the attire that the woman was most likely wearing. So the first one was um, showing gaudy dress. That was what the Greek harlots wore. Here we have to deal with another issue in modesty and dress. There should be modesty in both colors and patterns of dress. We, I, we should not in our clothing be trying to draw attention to ourselves. So the clothing should not be something that someone first sees and goes and thinks of your clothing, unless it is the fact that they see that your clothing is a Christian clothing, and that's why you stand out. But if they see that your clothing is fancy or is showy in any way, they should not, if you're a Christian, they should not be seeing that first. So John Wesley, he gave some advice on dress, and in regard to this modesty issue, he said, wear nothing though you have it already, which is of a glaring color, or which is any kind gay, which in that time meant bright or lively, glistening or showy, nothing apt to attract the attention of the bystanders. So in our clothing, if we would not have the clothing of a harlot, our clothing should not be trying to attract the attention of those that are around us. A second century writer said, for as the brand shows the slave, so do gaudy colors the adulteress. So even into the second century, it was still that the colors of the clothing, if they were, or the way the clothing was made, if it was to draw attention to oneself, it was the clothing of a harlot or an adulteress. Okay, so what else is part of a harlot's apparel? If you go to Mark 7, 21 through 23, it tells many different sins that Jesus said come out of the heart of man. And one of these mentioned that he mentioned was lasciviousness. Now, that's a big word that we don't often use today, but I want to look at what it means. Lasciviousness, the second definition for it in Webster's dictionary is tendency to excite lust and promote irregular indulgences. So lasciviousness is something that excites lust. It makes people lust. It makes people engage in wrong things or at least think along those lines. Now in regard to the lust issue, if we look in Matthew 5, Jesus dealt with this issue. He says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So if we put these two together, lasciviousness is something, or one of the things it can mean is something that causes someone to lust. And Jesus said that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery. So Jesus condemned the act of lusting after the woman, but lasciviousness tells us that it's not just the act of lusting, but if 
say the woman is doing anything that is causing the man to lust, she is also guilty. Or if you reverse the genders, it doesn't happen as often that a woman will lust after a man, but occasionally it can happen. So you could reverse the genders. But if you are doing something that causes someone to lust after you, you are guilty as well as they. The Bible is very clear. We are not to be a stumbling block for other people. Romans 14, 13 says, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So it says, we're not to put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in our brother's way. If we're Christians, we won't do something that might cause them to fall. Now, we're talking about dress, and I'm going to talk from the perspective of a woman's dress. If a woman dresses in a way that causes, that tempts a man to lust after her, she is putting a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his way, which is not Christian love toward her brother. And Jesus tells us through the Bible that we are not to do that. Now the word used in this verse for occasion to fall also means offense. And it is used in Matthew 18, 7, where Jesus said, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that the offense come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. So Jesus said, there will be sins in the world, there will be bad things that happen, but woe to those who they come by. So men... Are, may be going to have struggles with impure thoughts. There are worldly men that aren't even going to try to control their thoughts. But Jesus says, Woe to him who the offense cometh by. If we have put of an occasion to fall in our brother's way, then there's a woe on us as well because we are causing him to fall. Like we talked about in the previous uh, presentation, the issue is love. The first one was love to God. The first commandment is love to God that Jesus talked about. And the second, he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We're to love our brothers and sisters. And that means in our dress, not doing something that will cause them to fall. We don't want to do something that might cause them to be lost. And as a Christian, we don't even want to wear something that might cause our brothers to struggle to keep pure thoughts. That is not Christian love. And if we love God and we love our brothers, we will not do that. Now, if we go further, Habakkuk 2.15 makes it clear that it is wrong to look on nakedness. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So here it gives a woe on those that got people drunk so that they could look on their nakedness. So looking on nakedness is no better than going and committing adultery. In God's eyes, it's the same. Now, as we talk about this, People will raise the objection, why should women be responsible for men's thoughts? Shouldn't the men just guard their thoughts? Now, this is not the best objection because only a Christian man is even going to try to guard his thoughts. A worldly man is just going to enjoy thinking what he wants to think. But even a Christian man who's trying to guard his thoughts, I want to use the scenario of Joseph in Egypt. You can see in this picture that the Egyptian dress was not modest. It was not nice dress. The, a lot of the dress was totally see-through. And a lot of times the women were not covered on top. It was not, their fashions then were just as bad as ours today, if not even a little bit worse sometimes. So that was the society Joseph went into as a Christian young man. And Potiphar's wife 
not only was she, would she have been culturally not modestly dressed, she also had an agenda to seduce Joseph. So she was probably even pushing the boundaries as far as Egyptian dress went. Joseph did not allow her dress to lead him to impure thoughts. Joseph guarded his mind. That's why he was able to say, I will not do this wickedness and sin against God. Joseph guarded his mind. That is the example for a Christian man. Regardless of how the women are dressed, a Christian man should guard his mind and his thoughts. But a Christian woman should not be a Potiphar's wife. Christian women should not dress like Potiphar's wife. We should not be wearing things that could lead a man to have to struggle. That's not Christian charity. So yes, men should guard their thoughts, but women should not do things to lead a man to have to even try to guard his thoughts on that topic. The other thing in regards to women dressing modestly is, well, the men should guard their thoughts. Like we said, worldly men are not even going to have a reason to guard their thoughts. And as women have gotten less modest in their dress, we have seen that it has also endangered women. This is a quote that says, some years ago a national magazine published an article by La Amour that addressed how women were viewed in the Old West. So this is talking about the olden days. It says, he observed that almost uniformly they were treated with great respect even by the roughest of men. He noted that as a rule, females could travel alone hundreds of miles by stagecoach and feel quite secure because men regarded them so highly and were extremely protective of the fairer sex. Those days are gone and have been for quite a while. Now a woman can hardly walk unescorted down a crowded street without being verbally assaulted or in some fashion sexually harassed. Most men in large cities don't want their wives driving alone at night. One recent author believes she knows, at least in part, one cause for this dramatic shift in attitude toward women. She says it involves the loss of modesty. So in the olden days, you did have occasionally times when you got a man that was just corrupt. But as a general rule, the men respected women. But at the same time, this was in a generation when, as a general rule, the women dressed modestly and behaved modestly. And in this generation, while the women have declared more liberty, you have seen that the respect level has gone down and it is dangerous now for women. So one of the things is it is of benefit for the woman herself to dress more modestly. She is decreasing her chances of being assaulted because she is no longer making herself a object of lust. She is trying to point people to Christ. Okay, also on this nakedness issue, we see in the Bible that nakedness is a sign of demon possession. In Luke 8, 27, you see Jesus, he came to, uh, he was on the ship, he came to land. It says, when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. So this man had been demon possessed for a long time and it says he didn't wear any clothes. But the same story, if you go to verse 35, you can see after Jesus cast out the demons, it says, Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So here you can see that the man before he was, before when he had the demons in him, he was naked. When Jesus cast out the demons, he was clothed. So nakedness is a sign of sin and demon possession. Being clothed is what we should be as Christians. Nakedness, however, does not always mean without clothes. It can mean that you don't have proper clothing. It says, for thou hast taken, a, this is in Job 22, 
It says, For thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught and stripped the naked of their clothing. So naked in the Bible sometimes means no clothing, sometimes it means improper clothing. There wasn't sufficient clothing. You can see this also with Laodicea. Laodicea does not realize they are naked. It says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So Laodicea is the final church talked about in Revelation, and they do not recognize that they are naked. Now, this is talking about a spiritual, they do not recognize they are spiritually naked, but could it also be that the church in the last days may not recognize that they're physically naked as well? But what I want to point out from this is the word naked used here in reference to Laodicea, according to Thayer's Greek lexicon, it means, it can mean unclad, without clothing, ill-clad, and it can also mean clad in undergarments only. So like we talked about naked, you can mean, it can mean totally unclad. It can mean that you're ill clad, you don't have sufficient clothing. And here it says it can also mean clad in undergarments only. <clears throat> now do we see people today that are clad in undergarments only? By definition, they are then naked. We can see in the Bible that nakedness also includes many clothes. It says, if you go to Genesis 3, the eyes of them both were opened, they knew they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Like we mentioned in the previous one, the aprons were just a loin covering. So they were only had the most private areas covered. They were not fully clothed. It says, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So here, Adam was clothed in, we might say, many clothes. He had on a loin covering. But he says he was afraid because he was naked. So we can see that naked, if you're not properly clothed, if you only have a little clothing on, it's still, you're still naked by biblical definition. And we can see that modern society actually traces the origins of modern fashions back to uh, these aprons they wore. This picture is from a store called Eve's Leaves, and it says, first in fashion. So they even recognize that modern dress traces back, not to the covering of light, but to the aprons that Adam and Eve tried to fashion for themselves. Okay, we're gonna look at biblical modesty and look at some things that the Bible says are naked that need to be covered. If we go to Isaiah 20, verse 4, it says, So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners and Ethiopian captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. So here it mentions that they were naked and it tells what that includes. Okay, but most people would also class that if the buttocks are uncovered, it's naked. Although there are some very skimpy swimming suits that would uncover this nakedness. But it goes even further if you go to Exodus 28, verse 42. The priests were told that they were to make linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs shall they reach. Now, the priests were wearing long robes. So this was actually what they're told to wear as underclothing under a robe to cover their nakedness. But in order to fully cover their nakedness under the robe, 
they're told that it has to reach from the loins even to the thighs. The thigh, according to the dictionary, is the uh, part of men which is between the leg and the trunk. Now the leg can mean the whole leg from your hip all the way down to your foot, but if it's used in separate from being the whole leg, which is what it's used here, it's properly that part of the limb from the knee to the foot. So the thigh is the part that reaches from uh, the trunk, which is the body, to the knee. So this is the part that the priests were to cover. They were to have from their loins to their knee covered in order to cover their nakedness. Now, by that definition, there's a lot of people today whose nakedness is not properly covered. Biblical modesty also. Now, if you look in the Bible in reference to the breast of a woman connected with uh, men, you will find that they are connected in connection with men either to a marriage relationship or to an adulterous relationship. The Bible is very clear that they are attractive to a man. So if you would not be causing men to lust after you, the breast also should be covered. You can read in Proverbs 5, it's talking about a marriage relationship. It says to drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind and a pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? So here it connects that the, a woman's breasts are for her husband and not for a strange man. You can also see in Ezekiel 23 where it's talking about... Uh, them committing whoredom. It says they committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breast pressed and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. So it's connecting breast to they should be for the husband. If they're not for the husband, then it's connected to adultery and whoredom. So if it's wrong for a man, if a man looking on a woman is lusting or if a man looking on a woman can cause him that is ill clad can cause him to lust after the woman then because the bible is very clear that that part of a woman her breasts are attractive to men she should cover her breast one pastor who preached a sermon on modesty he came up with a list of what he called tin magnets for men's eyes and his whole church basically agreed with him, or all the men in the church at least agreed with him, that these tin magnets, as he called them, are problematic for men. They cause a struggle for men, and they are not modest clothing for a Christian woman. So we're going to go through this list. Number one, the first magnet, is dresses or skirts with lengthy slits. Basically, your skirt or dress is only as long as the slit in it. If you have a ankle-length skirt, but you have a slit to the knee, then your skirt is only to the knee. Uh, if it's higher than the knee, the slit, then the skirt is to that point. You can't say you have on a long skirt, but then you have a slit that goes all the way up the leg and think you're modest. Dresses, number two is dresses or skirts which hug the buttocks. So this is tight skirts or dresses that they don't just come draped nicely over buttocks. They actually come in at the bottom. They're hugging that part of the woman's body. And that is not modest because it is emphasizing that part. Number three is any upper garment that hugs the breast. So again, the same as the previous one, this is emphasizing that part of a woman's body. It's making it more noticeable and it's tight around that part. Number four 
is unbuttoned blouses, low necklines, or cleavage on any upper body garment. So this is things that are showing cleavage, things that are showing portions of the breast in the neckline, whether it be because the shirt is not fully buttoned or whether it be because the neckline is just low. This is not modest. And for necklines, the best way to uh, make sure your neckline is good is to check them, do a mirror check. You, if you get up in the morning and get dressed, check your neckline, not just to see if it's high enough when you're standing, but also to make sure it's high enough when you, uh, and it doesn't gape when you bend over. Because many times a woman may think her neckline is high enough, and it may be high enough if she's standing upright, but then when she has to bend over in public to do something, then the neckline gapes, and then people can see far down into her shirt. Number five is sleeveless blouses or dresses with large armholes. So this is the uh, sleeves on the piece of clothing. If they have large armholes or there is no sleeves and it shows a large armhole, then you can see in sometimes and see the breast or you can see the bra, you can see the woman's underwear. That is not modest. So also check your sleeves to make sure that if you lift your arms, people cannot see in and see your breast. Okay, number six is low rise skirts or pants. So this is skirts or pants that are not coming up high enough. And for that reason, they are showing some of the middle of the woman. So check your, not don't just check your neckline and your sleeves, also check where your skirts or pants are coming to. Number seven is see-through clothing of any kind. Now, just like the Egyptians, they might have been fully clothed, but they wore basically a piece of material that you could see straight through. Today, a lot of clothing is also see-through. So this one you have to check by just looking how the material you can see through it and check it in the light because sometimes if you have light behind you, for example, say a skirt, your the material, it might look like it's not see-through, but if you have light behind you, someone can see straight through. So check it not just in a dark room, but also check it where you have light behind you to make sure that it cannot be seen through. Number eight is skirts and dresses that are just plain too short. So this one's pretty clear, just if the skirt or dress is too short. And like we already talked about, God said that to cover your nakedness, you need to cover from the loins to the thigh, covering all of the upper leg to the knee, just to cover the nakedness. That was an undergarment. So skirts and dresses that are coming above the knee are definitely too short. Number nine, slacks or pants that hug the buttocks, the thighs, and the crotch. These are pants that are too tight. So this can be maybe a tight pair of jeans or even a tight pair of leggings. Pants that are too tight are also a problem for men because they're showing the form of the woman. So tight pants are not modest. And then number 10 is a bared midriff and back. So this is again the same where the shirt and the skirt or pants are not meeting right and the it comes up in the back and you can see the back of the woman. All of these have been agreed on by multiple Christian men that these are not modest, that these can cause men to lust. So, or can tempt men to lust. So, these are not things that should be found in a Christian woman's clothing. Now I want to also here state that biblical modesty is not just for women. We've talked mostly about for women because women are the typically the ones that are most drawn to fashion and immodesty is typically a bigger issue with women. But I want to state that biblical modesty also goes for men. 
as well because the, you, a man can also be tempting to a woman if he's not modest. In Ezekiel 23, 14 through 17, we see this. It says, And she increased her whoredoms, for when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes to look to after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them unto Chaldea. And the Babylonians came to her into a bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom. And she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. So here's using the description of a female, and it says she saw pictures or images of these men and it says she doted upon them when she saw these images of them and the word doted there means lusted so she lusted after these men and it is of interest that it is mentioned that well they had girdles upon their loins and they had uh, dyed attire upon their heads there is no mention of an upper body garment on them but this was a case where a female, it's referenced that a female lusted after seeing men. So biblical modesty should be for men as well. And we can also see in this that this was, uh, she did not even see real people. She was actually seeing images or pictures or statues of these people. Okay, we can also see uh, in John 21 where Peter was fishing. It says when Jesus came, it said, uh, Now when, Pete, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Now this was a case where they're out fishing, and Simon Peter, when he hears this Jesus, it says he put on his fisher's coat for he was naked. Now, it is not likely that they were actually fishing totally naked. Rather, this would mean probably that they were in more girded at their loins, but did not have on an upper body garment. And he classed that as naked. And out of respect for Jesus, he clothed himself before he came to Jesus. So again, this was a man. So we can see that biblical modesty is not just for women, it's also for men. Men should also clothe themselves modestly. We can also see this in Genesis 3, 7 and 21. We've already talked about this, how Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they made themselves aprons, which was loin coverings. And when God came he made them coats now the word coat uh, means a shirt a coat garment or robe so and it comes from a word meaning to clothe the shoulder so both adam and his wife were clothed on the lower part they were not clothed on the upper part when god came adam said he was naked he classed himself as naked even though he had a lower body covering and when God came and gave them coats, he clothed the top part of the body. So we can see for a man to be unclothed on the top part of his body is nakedness, according to the Bible. If you go to Proverbs 7, it's, Proverbs 7 is a chapter describing the case of a woman trying to seduce a man and how she succeeded in doing this. And it says in verse 23, talking about him going with her after she has caught him, it says, Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. So it connects a bird being caught in a snare to this issue of moral versus immoral behavior. How is a bird caught in a snare? Proverbs 1, verse 17 says, Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And 
those that have uh, known some of the ways that they'll catch birds, one of the ways they'll catch birds, because they, they can't spread the net, like the Bible says, in the sight of any bird, is that they will put the snare, and then they'll put food in the snare. But the bird's not going to first fly into the, uh, straight into the trap. So they'll make a trail of food away from the trap, and the bird will come to the end of the trail of food, and then little by little it will move closer and closer and closer, just following the food, and nothing happens to it, so it's not paying attention until it's in the trap, and then it's caught. Now this is the way the devil has been working on the dress issue in many different lines, and on also many other issues, is he has, instead of leading people directly to where he wants them, he's put them on a trail where little by little he's broken down. Let's take the example of modesty. Little by little he's broken down the modesty level until he gets them where he wants them, which he wants the opposite of God's way. Like with Adam and Eve, he wants total nakedness. So little by little he's been leading us in that direction. Now you can see this in the example of the swimsuit. This picture is from 1864. You can see that the swimsuit of the woman, she's covered from her ankles to her wrist to her neck. Her whole body is covered. She's covered in a skirt all the way to her knees and baggy uh, bloomer-like pants all the way to her ankles. Very uh, well covered. This was 1864. This is what the swimsuits at that time were. And during and in this generation, the men and women didn't even swim together. This was what the women wore when the women swam with women. They didn't even swim with the opposite gender. In uh, the 1870s, you can see still very well covered. 1904, you can see that the sleeves has gone to short sleeves. The uh, neckline is still high and it's still very, it's not form fitting, but you can see the skirt has, it's at the knees and now it is no longer bloomer like pants to the ankles. It's just uh, more like a tight that's covering the leg. By 1910, you can see that basically the sleeves are totally gone. Now you have nothing. You have bare legs up to the knees. And you can see how this body is slowly being uncovered. In this picture, you can see what before this time, and they still had it at this time, you can see uh, they had little like wagon houses that they would take down into the water. So the woman, uh, was not shown. She would go straight from this thing into the water. And they had had this up until this time. So all the previous generations, if they went to the beach, they also used this where they were not uh, showing their swimwear to the opposite gender. So you can see that slowly the swimsuit, more and more of the body's getting uncovered. Uh, then if you go to skip to the 1920s, you can see that basically there's no skirt. If there is a, uh, in some of the swimsuits, there might have been a skirt. This particular one appears to be more shorts. It's above the knee. It's tight. You can see the back starting to be uncovered. The sleeves are totally gone and there's nothing really covering the legs. So you can see already how quickly the uh, body is being uncovered. If you skip forward to 1946, you can see a two-piece swimming suit coming in. You still have, in this one, you still have a short skirt, but uh, you have a skimpy top on, and the middle now of the woman is starting to be showed. Also in 1946 is when the bikini was introduced which uncovered even 
more of the woman's body. So this is, you can see in less than a hundred years how the swimsuit changed, but it didn't, he didn't, uh, the devil didn't immediately take the women that were used to dressing modestly and hand them a bikini and say, okay, now you go out in this because they wouldn't have worn it. Little by little, he started uncovering more and more until he can get them into where they're wearing basically nothing. Now, some places in the world, you even today have topless beaches. Uh, and a lot of people also wear G-string. So, and some places you even have total nudist beaches where they wear nothing. So he has slowly broken down society until he can get where he wants them to be. And you can take this with any article of clothing or clothing as an overall. The modesty level of women has been broken down and also the modesty level of men. Slowly he's un the devil is undressing our world. Now on this issue of a, the attire of a harlot, I want to talk about another thing that also plays in to uh, being seductive clothing. I'm going to look at high heels. If you look at the history of high heels, according to Wikipedia, it talks about how they were worn in different uh, cultures for different reasons. Egyptian butchers wore hills to help them walk above the blood of dead beast, uh, and it tells different ones. But we see in ancient Rome, it says the sex trade was legal and female prostitutes were readily identified by their high heels. So in ancient Rome, high heels were an identifying mark of a prostitute. If we come into history even closer, in the 1600s, it says men were the first sex to don the shoe. They were adopted by the European aristocracy of the 1600s as a signal of status. The logic was only someone who didn't have to work could possibly go around in such impractical footwear. Interestingly, this was the same logic that encouraged foot binding in China. Women started wearing heels as a way of trying to appropriate masculine power. With the Enlightenment, which emphasized rationality, that is, that is practical footwear, everyone quit wearing high heels. What brought heels back for women? Pornography. Mid-19th century pornographers began posing female nudes in high heels, and the rest is history. So in ancient Rome, it was uh, prostitutes that wore high heels. It came back in... In the 1600s, you can see that men were wearing high heels, uh, and it was a sign of status. But when society became more interested in doing things that were practical, everyone quit wearing high heels. But it says what brought it back in was pornography, was what brought high heels back in. Now, why is high heels often connected to sexual things. According to Wikipedia, it says research shows that heels draw attention to long legs and small feet. Some argue that high-heeled shoes, perhaps more than any other item of clothing, are seen as the ultimate symbol of being a woman. High heels often play a key role in emphasizing a wearer's, most commonly a woman's, arched back and extended buttocks. This natural courting pose sexualizes the wearer and can turn them into objects subjected to, male, to the male gaze. This research highlights the emphasis Hills place on the appearance of the wearer instead of their more valuable internal traits such as intelligence, creativity, or strength. So even the secular world recognizes that high heels, the way that they make the woman's body, uh, the way they'll make a woman stand, and what they emphasize in the woman's body sexualizes the wearer and can turn them into objects subjected to male gaze. So it can, basically they're saying high heels can turn you into an object of lust. And they're saying that it places emphasis on your appearance rather than your more valuable internal traits. 
So this is not what we as a Christian woman want. Now, some people may feel that talking about all these issues in dress, that these are very little issues, that we shouldn't be delving into little issues. There are much bigger issues to deal with. And I would leave you with the words of John Wesley on that topic. If you feel like dress is a little issue, if you feel like, for example, hills and those things are a little issue and they're not a big deal, then why do you not want to give them up? John Wesley said, and he dealt with some, uh, when he was dealing with dress and some issues in dress that are very small issues, people would say. He said, it is true, these are little, very little things. Therefore, they are not worth defending. Therefore, give them up, let them drop, throw them away without another word. Else a little needle may cause much pain in the flesh, a little self-indulgence much hurt to your soul. So if you feel like something is a little thing, why don't you want to give it up? Is it really as little as you think it is? Okay, to recap, we learned that God's word commands Christians, especially women, to dress modestly. Christian modesty is to say, look at God, not at me, by our dress and our actions. And Jesus is our example of modesty because he had no form nor comeliness. So there was nothing in his outward appearance to draw people to him. We learn that wearing jewelry or makeup for Christians is condemned by the Bible. Both were originally connected to paganism and harlotry. And we learn that showing one's nakedness is wrong. So we should avoid all the things we talked about where we are showing our nakedness. Where we're showing something we shouldn't show or where we're going too close to the line. And we should avoid even the appearance of evil in our dress. In closing, I would like to read this quote. This will uh, be introducing our next uh, presentation. It says, the following statement by a pastor is typical of those made by many others. He said, I believe the most important issue in female modesty is the issue of a chaste heart. If the woman desires to please her Savior and honor her brother in Christ, there is seldom an issue with the clothing she wears. Mandating modest clothing without focusing on creating a chaste heart does little good. If the woman wears modest clothing but is sensual in the way she walks or conducts herself, it will invariably cause a man to lust. I don't need to see skin to cause me to lust. We men have pretty good imaginations. So in our first presentation, we talked about how the heart has to be changed. In this one, we've talked about if your heart is changed and you wanting to know what is modest in clothing, we've covered in this presentation what is modest and immodest in clothing. And in the next presentation, we're going to look at modesty again, but we're going to look at modesty in our actions because it's not enough to just have modest clothing. We also have to be modest in our actions. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for all the blessings you've given to us. Thank you for being with us today. Please help us as we try to implement the things we have learned from your word. Help us and lead and guide us and teach us. And please help us to be Christians that have your modesty. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. Amen. Thank you.